everyone, and welcome to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. We're glad that you tuned in for this, our Oscar edition. Yes, we get ready for a big weekend for the movies. And you think of movies, you cannot help but think of horse racing. Okay, maybe not exactly horse racing, but you think about horses in movies. How many movies have included horses? Let's face it, when you're sitting at home over those holidays like a Memorial Day or a Fourth of July weekend, you're not watching a marathon of Gandhi, Amadeus, and Chariots of Fire. You're seeing marathons of John Wayne and Clint Eastwood westerns. Everybody likes to watch westerns. They love horses. Horse racing has been a big part of Hollywood for years. Many of the Hollywood stars back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s used to hang out at the track. And even a little later than that, uh, even up into the 80s, you'd have like Fred Astaire and Cary Grant going to movies. I remember one of my favorite things was meeting Mr. Don Amici, who had a horse running in the Breeders' Cup in 1993 at Santa Anita. We were out there that morning. He was watching morning workouts and standing on the apron with this legendary actor whose uh, career spanned like five decades, uh, you would probably remember him most for, I mean, some of the younger ones would remember him most uh, for Trading Places with uh, Eddie Murphy's movie, and, uh, and then also for Cocoon, which he won a Best Actor for, uh, Supporting Actor. He won the Oscar for that in Cocoon, the Ron Howard movie with the, all the uh, elderly people that become young again when they jump into the pool that the aliens have put the pods in. And uh, one of my favorite movies of his is uh, a David Mamet movie that uh, things change. I thought uh, Don Amici was great in that. And he made another movie called Folks, which is a very dark comedy about getting old. And I asked him about that movie because it only come out about a year or so beforehand because my parents enjoyed that, and I enjoyed it. And he said it's probably a little too dark for most people because it was that kind of comedy that's politically incorrect today because they made some fun of situations, but it wasn't in that cliched way that you see so many. But anyway, Don Amici was telling me stories of when he would come to the racetrack and there'd be Betty Grable and Tyrone Power, and they'd be sitting in the box together, and he'd point up there, and, you know, Bing Crosby or Pat O'Brien might walk by, someone like that. That was the special golden era where Hollywood and the movies came together, uh, where the actors were at Hollywood Park or at Santa Anita or down at Del Mar on a regular basis, uh, flying in for the Kentucky Derby or whatever. Bob Hope, people like that went to the track. That doesn't exist anymore. I remember when Seabiscuit came out, and the hope was the Breeders' Cup was hoping that all these actors, because it was in at Santa Anita that year that Seabiscuit come out, would show up at the track and present trophies. Uh, but Toby McGuire wasn't there. N none of the big actors showed up for this. Uh, the only guy that was there from the movie that I can remember is Gary Stevens, who was riding in the Breeders' Cup, uh, the jockey who also played, who also acted in that movie. But it's, it's kind of a bygone era, that, that is for sure. One thing I like about movies, along with horse racing, you can have a favorite. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best, but it's a favorite movie. Uh, for example, Secretariat, greatest racehorse ever, probably hard to argue against that. But maybe he's not your favorite horse. Maybe there's some sentimental value about that. You talk about legendary movies like Cat uh, Casablanca or uh, The Godfather, some, some movies like that. Uh, are these the best movies ever? Yeah, they're among the best movies ever, but maybe your favorite is some off-the-wall movie out there, something that made you laugh or brings back a memory. And that's what a good movie and a good racehorse should do is evoke some kind of memory with you uh, that made you laugh or cry or, or got some kind of emotional response. That's what I love about movies and horse racing. And today we've got on the show Michelle Phillips, who is stars in the greatest movie ever made about horse racing. You know what that is. Thomas Kenny, our researcher. 1989's Let It Ride. You are correct, sir. Let It Ride. Greatest movie ever made about horse racing. It's just so much fun. You can't help but have fun. If you don't know what the movie's about, and I suggest that you, I don't know, it's, it's probably on Netflix still or something. It's still available to watch today. I've seen it. You've seen it? Mm -hmm. Which was made like, you know, 20 years before you were born almost yep. or something like that. Uh, did you enjoy it? I did. I did. And the story, basically, here, here's the capsule of it. Uh, David Johansson is a cab driver along with Richard Dreyfus and their buddies, and Dreyfus is a degenerate gambler, and he overhears, because he tapes conversations in the back of his cab, and he overhears 
a tip on a horse race that's being fixed. So he goes to the track, even though he's promised his wife, Terry Gar that he would never go again. And he goes out there and he's having the day that every gambler hopes they have where he can do nothing wrong. Even the race that he doesn't get to bet on, he would have lost. So in a way, he didn't lose. And it's hilarious all throughout. Jay Trotter's a character. There's so many good lines in that movie. And uh, Robbie Coltrane is the teller in that. And so they become buddies as the movie progresses. And they're, they, they make a bet and they sit around and they smoke a cigarette together. They're so nervous waiting for this to go uh, to see how this race is going. Well, Michelle Phillips plays Mrs. Davis in it. She has one of the great lines in the movie. And Michelle will be joining us uh, soon from California. And we're going to talk about the making of that. And then we'll talk about uh, horse racing and taking a look at the Kentucky Derby. Not that far away with Jay Privman, also based in Southern California, a great writer with the Daily Racing Forum and a longtime friend. So we're talking some movies and some horse racing today. So, movies and horse racing. Uh, Thomas, uh, what else do we have over there? Well, like you said earlier, Secretariat back in 2010. Yeah. That was nominated in, I believe, the ESPYs when that was still a thing. Yes. Uh, for best sports movie of the year. Yeah. I remember seeing that myself. Yeah, did you like it? I enjoyed it. Yeah, I did too. I thought As someone was... who knew next to nothing about the sport, and, you know, of course, I'd been to the local racetrack Keeneland with my parents a few times, but, uh, you know barely old enough to remember yeah secretary it's a good movie it's one that uh i think will stand the test of time to, among horse racing movies what else do you have in the horse racing world well i think the as far as you know going critically acclaimed you can't talk about horse racing movies without mentioning sea biscuit yeah yeah that is that's a terrific movie and uh we're gonna have gary stevens on down the road we'll talk about that the the jockey who uh popped into acting in that with opposite Toby Maguire. He was, he was so good in that movie and the movie itself was good. And what a story. Seabiscuit, did that touch you? That's a good story. That know? one's still on my watch list. So yeah, you know, I've obviously read a plot synopsis for research purposes, but uh, tried not to spoil too much of it for myself. Leonardo DiCaprio dies. No, no, he's not in that <laughs> one. I think you got the wrong one there. I ruined it for everybody last week in episode four. Yeah, I was talking about other movies, and we got into that. Any, any other movies that grab you about horse racing from your research? Well, I did some digging on, you know, movies of Hollywood's past and came up with 1938's Kentucky. It's a yeah. Romeo and Juliet love story about horse racing. Yes, it is. That's, that's a good one. That was one that some will say of the Hollywood historians that that's the one that kind of set the standard for horse racing and in some ways, uh, that kind of movie, and, and it was. It was a, it was great because it, it dated even back to, like, the Civil War and the Yankee and the Confederate families that hated each other, and then as it moves on years, years, decades later, yeah, the families, and of course, the, the woman falls in love with the man, and they're on feuding families. Loretta Young is the star in that, and Walter Brennan picked up his second Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in that movie, Kentucky 19. Very good, very good. Um you know, National Velvet, it's not a horse racing movie, but it's about horse jumping and all horse shows. Elizabeth Taylor, Mickey Rooney, that's one. Little Miss Marker, we talked about that before. Shirley Temple, where she's put up because her, her dad can't pay off the bookie, so they, they let her stay around and hang around. Uh, and, you know, there's just a lot of movies. A uh, Far Lap is one that's based on a true story that's really good. Boy, it's a sad story, though, but it's a very emotional story. And uh, Dreamer came out a few years ago, and it's got Kurt Russell. You ever see that? When Kurt Russell's, if Kurt Russell's in a movie, I watch it. I just think he's that actor that you just say, man, that guy, that guy can act. And uh, so, so those are just some of the movies that we enjoy. And horse racing is a big part of it. I mean, how, think about all the movies that have a horse in it. it. May not be a horse racing movie, Thomas, but you know, you see a western. What do you got? Got horses. Got horses. <laughs> and good gracious, they've made, especially you go back like 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It was like westerns were like every other movie, it seems, that came out, wasn't it? Something like that. So good stuff, good research. Like the 1938 Kentucky thing in there. Like that. That's the movie. All right, Let It Ride. Again, I just think it's a terrific movie. Delighted to have Michelle Phillips with us. She'll join us when we come back, the actress. And now, with her appearance on this show, we are now the only horse racing show in history to have a Super Bowl winning coach, a Kentucky Derby winning owner, a Triple Crown winning jockey, and a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're building up quite the resume here. Isn't and only five episodes. 
<laughs> What's left, Thomas? Where can we go? I don't know. We might be topping out too early here. Oh, jeez. I don't know. April, what do you think? I think we're on a roll. And April now gets a speaking See, April's getting a speaking part now in the show. <laughs> it gets, just gets better and better. You're making it a big time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jay Pribman joins us later. We'll have our Root and Riddle vet check. But up next is the actress, singer-songwriter Michelle Phillips. Thank you for tuning in to the Horse Racing Show. Be sure to subscribe and like us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and like us there. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play, and at uh, Twitter at Horse Racing Show. Michelle Phillips, right around the corner. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Of course, this is the Oscar theme week horse racing show. We've talked about some of the movies that were made about horse racing that had horse racing themes. And as I said, the best ever is Let It Ride. If you're not even a horse racing fan, you'll like Let It Ride. Hopefully, you can still find it out there somewhere. Get a VHS copy. I've got it on VHS and DVD. I don't like to flaunt you, it. You, you can. And with Judy us, Bennett just found it on her phone. Yeah, you can watch it everywhere. And delighted to have Michelle Phillips with us. I've been a big fan for a long time, a singer, a songwriter, and an actress. And, you know, we'd all be safe and warm if we were in L.A. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing one of the great lines, obviously, California Dreaming, that Michelle co-wrote. And she is a co-star and, and in the movie. you'd be right, because, you know, it's about uh, 68 degrees in Los Angeles right now. And the sun is shining, and it's blue skies, and uh, that's that's why we live here. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, and it's the perfect day to go to the track. Ah, uh, yeah, and you've you've been going to the track, I understand, since your dad was taking you as a little kid growing up uh, in Los Angeles and in Mexico City, in Mexico I believe. Mexico City, actually. Yeah. So you're growing up in yeah, Mexico we City used to and go going to, to the track. Aguas Calientes track in Mexico City, and. And and there, if you if you were tall enough to reach the uh, the, uh, the window, you you could buy a ticket. And I was always very very lucky. I would, uh, you know, I would uh, bet on horses based on their their name or their color or, and, and I, I didn't know how to read a. Uh, what you might call it? The but, form, yeah, at that time. Uh, a form, yeah, but I, but I was always very lucky, and I, it that continued throughout my life. Wow, hey, do, do you read the form now, or do you go still by colors and names? I go by colors and names, and actually, you know, I'm going to give you the secret right now to me winning every every. Uh, 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 every race. Okay, I need that. I buy a win ticket on every horse. <laughs> 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 and people are so impressed with my abilities. Uh, you know, they're always asking me for tips, and and I say, well, you know, I, I don't want to give you bad information. You know, it's really just such what 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 you sense, and then the the, the whole, whatever horse comes in, I'm jumping up and down and saying, "That a girl, that a girl." <laughs> <laughs> you know, the people that are listening to this, Michelle, you just blown your cover. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's okay. I don't mind sharing. It always works, and I always win. So, you know, uh, I I I can't, uh, you know, I can't say enough about the the, the system. No, I can't either. It's perfect. It's and especially <laughs> when you hit a if you hit a fifty to one shot, you've made your whole day. And you know what? I've done that. Yeah, I, I have done that. So and. And I've actually had horse people tell me that there are a lot of people who do this and and uh, win. Wow. So you know it 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 works. But you know I remember the day that that I got a call from uh, from David Geiler, who was the producer of Let It Ride, and um, wanted to know if I'd come in and read for uh, 
the part of Richard Dreyfuss's wife. And uh, so I said, yeah, and I I got there, and uh, and they said, look, we have to make a, a, a confession to you. We've already made an offer to, to Terry Garr. But she hasn't given us an answer, and you know, if she decides to to do it, we're going to have to give it to her. I said, "Well, that's fair enough," you know. So I read, and I read well for it. But Terry Gar took the part. So, uh, and then I I went to Hong Kong to do another picture, and while I was there, I got a, another call from Guyler. Uh, the producer, um, who said, look, you know, Terry took the part and she, she's going to do it. But you have to turn it off. And so you became uh, Mrs. Davis in the movie. So then they said, but we're writing a part for you. Will you do it? And I said, whatever you write for me, I'll do. And uh, I was just delighted when they showed me uh, they showed me the the pages for Mrs. Davis because she is such a funny character. And I had not done any comedy at this point. And I, you know, I had worked with with uh, Richard Dreyfus before uh, on Dillinger, and. Uh, so my scenes were all with Richard Dreyfus, and I just said to him, uh, listen, I want you to give me a line reading for everything that I do. Now, uh, I'm sure you know what a line reading is. Yes. How would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and and so he said, you won't be offended if I give you a line reading? And I said, no, I'll pay you if you want me. <laughs> So uh, we had the most wonderful time. We we filmed the whole movie at Hialeah, and uh, Hialeah is outside of Miami. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful old it, track years ago, yeah. I don't think it's there anymore. Now they, they tried to reopen it and things. They've gone back and forth, but no, that day is long gone, sadly, because that was like, I never made it to that track. But uh, it, it was... Oh beautiful That's what and I've heard. Th th there was a lake in the middle of the track and uh, it it uh, housed a a flock of flamingos mm -hmm. that apparently were on their way from Peru to Canada and when Hialeah opened they they uh, they came on down and uh, saw the lake and and they never left Wow. We're talking and with Michelle. So, Michelle Phillips is with us, uh, and would great to have you. Uh, one of the co-stars of Let It Ride, and you're talking about uh, about line reading with Richard Dreyfuss. And one of the great movie lines, in my opinion, is when Richard Dreyfuss looks at you in the clubhouse and says, "Can I buy you a drink?" And I say, "I don't see why not. I'm on the pill." Yes, <laughs> I love that line. No matter how I many times too. I, <laughs> and and thank you for letting me. This this would be my only acting chance right there, Michelle. Thank you for letting me jump in there, and I got to run a line with you. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. What's made Let um, It Ride? You think such a fun movie? And again, you know about race horses. You've been going the track since you were a little girl. You still go to the track out there in Southern Cal. Why do you think that movie has yep. endured for so many of us now? Gosh, almost twenty years ago that movie was made. Yeah, right around twenty years ago. Yeah, more, actually. Yeah. But it was made in 89. So. Yeah. 80, 90, 130 years ago. Good grace. It doesn't. See, that's how vivid I remember so many of the things. You know, like Walking Tall Trotter, as they say to Jay Trotter is the guy. I think people have seen it by now. Richard Dreyfuss character. He puts the money in his shoe when he wins all this money. And, uh. And my friends still say that in the rare days that we actually win a few hundred bucks at the track, we'll say that walking tall trotter. I mean, or, you know, I'm having a very good day. I mean, there's so many, there's wonderful lines in that movie. And it just, was it a fun movie to make? It's, it's a fun movie to watch even to this day. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, you know, that, that, 
that's a movie with legs, and it's it's just a fun movie. You know, I I uh, was standing in line at Hollywood Park waiting to buy some some uh, tickets, and this man came up to me and he said, "Hello, Mrs. Davis," and I said. I'm sorry, I think you have the wrong person. He said, no, I don't. He says, you're Mrs. Davis from Let It Ride. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and he said, you know, I never come to the track without watching the movie first. And some people just think of it as a touchstone for them before they go to the track. And I I find that very... Uh, uh, lovely, and uh, I'm just so damn impressed with myself that I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, well, you should be. You know, I'm impressed. I mean, everybody is. I mean, I don't have – you're the first golden – we've had Super Bowl winning coach, a, a Triple Crown winning jockey, a Kentucky Derby winning owner on this show, but we've never had a Golden Globe nominee, and we've never had <laughs> – and we've never had a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on this show, Michelle. So you've just you just set the bar so high right now. Well, I'm so thrilled to do it. Thank you. Is it still fun to go to the track for you? Do you go out much uh, to, I guess, Santa Anita would be the home track or the one closest to you? Uh, yeah, it's Santa Anita. I had a birthday party there a couple of years ago. I invited 30 people, and we took one of their new... Uh, luxury suites and we had our own bartender and uh we could buy our tickets right in our own suite (laughs) and and they catered it and it was delicious and it was one of the most fun uh afternoons that i've ever spent with 30 of my closest friends and you won every race i won every race Walking tall, Michelle. Oh, you, you know, an, a, a, another a, another line that I just remembered is, uh, he said, "Do you feel lucky?" And I said, "I said, honey, some people luck, some people rub me for good luck." <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You just reminded me of it. It's a great line. Oh, that, that's there's this classics all the way through it. I, I you know, because you read about these movies, and, and obviously, you know, you've in dish to the singer and songwriter, your actor's career, and uh, Knott's Landing, and uh, Dillinger, the Golden Globe nomination you got, and all the movies around that. You know, you, you read about the actors don't get along, directors, actors sometimes clash. The movie still works out because they're all pros, but. I would imagine on a movie like Let It Ride, it just seemed like everybody would just have fun. It was such a feel-good, you just had a great time from the opening of that movie all the way to the end. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick little story here. When I, uh, I had not heard of Joe Pitka, the director, uh, before because it, he was a big commercial director. He, you know... But a couple of uh, women that he had worked with told me that he was awful to his models. He screamed and yelled at them, and he berated them. And he and uh, I'd already gotten the I'd already agreed to do the part. But I called David Geiler back, the producer, and I said, you know, maybe maybe we ought to rethink this, and maybe you ought to recast this because I don't let people talk to me like that, and. I would just walk off the film and then I would just disrupt the entire production and and I don't want to do that to you. Maybe you should just cast somebody else in this part. And David looked at me and he said, I'll tell you what, Michelle, if Joe does anything like that to you on the set or any time that you're in Florida, if he uh, screams at you, if he raises his voice, if he... Uh, does anything that embarrasses you or makes you feel bad, you have my permission to fire him on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) Now, that's the kind of producer you want to work with. And you know what? We never had one problem. (laughs) (laughs) It's good to be Michelle Phillips. (laughs) 
Everyone had a great time. <laughs> I, I want to ask you about California Dreaming that you co-wrote, if that's okay, because it's uh-huh. it's such an iconic song. And I believe I read this right a long time. You, you were like in New York or somewhere, and it was like a drab, rainy day or something, and that's how California Dreaming was written or the is something in that? Yeah, it was a drab, rainy night. John woke me up at around 3 o'clock in the morning with his guitar strapped to him as usual, and uh, he said, Michelle, listen, listen, I'm writing this song, listen to it. So he... Uh, sang the first eight bars to me, and I said, oh, that's really beautiful. (laughs) He says, well, wake up, help me write it. And I said, I'll help you write it tomorrow. He says, no, Michelle, wake up, help me write it now. You'll thank me for this someday. (laughs) And uh, I do. I do thank him. It was uh, a, a wonderful, a, a wonderful project that he brought me in on, and you know, really, to tell you the truth, I only wrote the second verse, and uh, he wrote all the music, and and he wrote the rest of the song. So uh, I I do thank him all the time. It's meant a great deal to me. And, you know, it, it's it. I'm sure it has. That's got to be a nice royal. I mean, this is like a what forty five year royal, fifty year royalty check. This is inc- and that yeah. And what an amazing song to to have that kind of staying power. Yeah, it does. It it, it does have legs, as they say. I remember the first time I came to California as we're getting ready to land. Growing up in Kentucky, I uh, would listen to California Dream and would come on, and I thought I got to get out there someday because everybody's pretty. And everybody's got a suntan, and that just looks like the place I got to get to L.A. And so when I was young enough, could finally get a, a Ford a plane ticket, I went there, and I remember humming "California Dreamin'" as I'm landing at LAX. <laughs> Year, I did years ago. I mean, okay, I'm in lo- you owe me a quarter then. <laughs> I owe you a quarter. You know, our, our mutual friend Judy Bennett, uh, who was a producer at a local TV station when I was first starting this sports casting business before "Let It Ride" came out. Um, yeah, when you she'll come to Kentucky because you've been to Kentucky, you've been to the Derby, and you've been to Breeders' Cups he, and he all. He brought me to the Derby. Yeah, first time I ever went to the Derby. My little Judy is sitting right here next to me. Hi, Judy. We're we're great, great friends. Oh, she's and, wonderful. Um, she just uh, you know she was working at Warner Brothers and um, and I was doing Knots Landing and she called me on the set and she said, "Listen, you." Uh, do you have any interest in going to the Kentucky Derby? <laughs> I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, you've been to the Oscars and the Kentucky Derby. Is there any kind of comparison between two big events like this? Well, the the Derby is so much more fun. <laughs> at, at least you don't have to be seated for three hours. Yeah. And we we would roam all over, you know, all, all over Churchill Downs, and and uh, I was in Kentucky last year. Where did we go to Lexington to? to uh, Harry Dean Stanton. Oh, uh, it, 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 we went to Harry Dean Stanton's Film Festival. Yeah. Because when they called and invited me to go to the festival, I said, "Great, when's Harry getting in?" And they said, well, he's never come. I said, what do you mean? He's never come to his own festival? And they said, no. I said, let me call you back. And I called him up and I said, Harry Dean, you're going to Kentucky. And we're going to have a great time. And we're going to your film festival. He said, you going to go? I said, yes, Harry, I am going to go. And so are you. And we had a blast. And then we went to, what was the name of the... I, and I stayed at Brett and Jones, Brett and Jones mansion. mansion. Brett and Jones. Brett and Jones, the former governor. Yeah, former oh, governor the, of Kentucky former and, governor. A, and a noted horse owner and breeder. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we stayed at their mansion and we rocked in rocking chairs on their porch and and um, drank all their bourbon and I made total nuisances of ourselves. I'm sure. No, but we had a fantastic, fantastic time. 
And what's the name of the racetrack that's in Lexington? Keeneland. Keeneland. Yeah. yeah we, we, uh, Judy took me to Keeneland, and we got a private tour of Keeneland. With Roger Beasley. With Roger Beasley. Yeah, Rogers Beasley. Yeah, know him well. He's a friend. Look, and it was just, you know, you got to hang out with Judy Bennett as much as possible. That's all I got to say. Well, I don't disagree with that. And, and the next time Judy <laughs> comes to Kentucky, you must come with her, and I'll give you that quarter. And, okay. Uh, and, you know, I, I can even buy you guys lunch. I'll take you out to lunch. We'll go crazy. You know, we got a little bit He's of a budget. He's inviting us to lunch. Yeah. We'll be there. Okay. Michelle, I can't tell you what delight it is to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. And and I love Let It Ride and California Dreaming. And uh, just getting to talk to you has been wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. The wonderful, talented Michelle Phillips joins us. Adding now a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to the roster that's been on the horse racing show here in only episode five. Be sure to follow us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe and like us on the YouTube channel. You can listen to us on iTunes, on Google Play. Go to thehorseracingshow.com and follow us at Horse Racing Show on Twitter. I'm Kenny Rice, and we'll be back with more right after this. <laughs> Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. It is time now for our Rude and Riddle Vet Check, which I always enjoy because I learned something, and I know that you're going to learn something too. And we have Dr. Raul Bras, who is with us now, who is the only person I know personally who is in the International Equestrian Veterinarian Hall of Fame, which is a big deal. Doctor, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Um, it might be a big deal for you, but I like to always stay humble and... and uh, Try to try to try to be as everybody else. I'm just trying to help our horses. That's all. You know, and I'm no set with all veterinarians. I, I really have not met a vet that has a major ego where you go, I, I, that he or she was tough to talk to, because it's it's about the horses. Yes, and and I have always said too that this industry, it uh, it treats you with a humble pie all the time. Every time <laughs> every time that you think you know it all, you realize that you actually don't know as much as you thought you did. That's, that's the thing about veterinary medicine. And, and describing my life as well. Yes. That's just, that's just the way it is with <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bross, I want to ask you about, uh, I guess, your specialty is laminitis. That'd be fair to say? Yeah, I mean, uh, I specialize in, in foot-related lameness, mm -hmm. which is podiatry. Um, and, and obviously, laminitis will be a big part of that, that part of the field. And the feet... As with any human athlete, even if you're not a great athlete, if you go out there and jog or walk a mile or two a day, you know, you got a sore foot. That's really painful. Yeah. I can't even imagine when you're carrying 1,100 pounds like a racehorse is around the track, uh, what it does for them when they have a, a, a hoof problem. Yeah, and, and, and to top it off, it's like I always say, there's no, no foot, no horse. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, if you talked about lameness, they, they say that at least 80% of your lameness is going to be foot-related. Um, you, you use the comparison of the horse, I mean the human. Um, it's even worse than that because the horse is actually standing on the last digit. So it's basically standing on your fingernails almost. Um, so that will be a, a comparison of how to use, you know, the horse's feet, the coughing bone will be your last phalanx on your finger. And then if you want to compare it a little bit more, your, your nail will be the hoof capsule of that mm -hmm. horse. So they're very, very, very prone to have issues related to their feet. And the most serious of these is laminitis, uh, which can be and oftentimes is fatal. So what exactly is laminitis? So laminitis, and I'm glad that you asked that because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion when it comes into it. Itis in veterinary medicine is basically inflammation. So the, the hoof, the internal structures, if to try to simplify things, the bone, the cuffing bone, or the last phalanx, or the distal phalanx, or the third phalanx, is actually attached to the hoof caps or to the hoof by the lamina. So when the horse has some sort of kind of inflammation of that lamina, that's laminitis. Doesn't mean that the horse has some sort of kind of displacement or rotation or in other words, people call them sinking, where they actually sink within their hoof capsule. 
that's when people start referring to the word of foundering, my horse founder. Mm -hmm. And and I try to differentiate that a little bit because when the horse is going through laminitis, doesn't mean that he has already had some sort of kind of displacement or rotation. He's basically in the early stages of that disease, which eventually becomes more of a biomechanical failure. Um, you start with the primary cause, which it might be some sort of kind of disease on the horse that targets the feet, the lamina. The lamina have some sort of kind of inflammation, and that breaks the bond between the hoof and the and the bone. And then the, due to the weight and the biomechanics and all those kind of ground reaction forces, the movement, the horse will actually is prone to have some sort of kind of separation from the hoof and have some displacement is extremely painful. Um, it, can that be true? Can you, can you get it? Can you get ahead of it and, and try to cure it? Most cases I know it, it gets to the point by the time it's discovered, it's incurable in a few of the racehorses I've covered that have died from laminitis. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad that you're saying that because that's my goal as a veterinarian. Uh, unfortunately, we have not been able to prevent it. Mm -hmm. But right now we're in the stages that the the damage assessment, it's, it's the priority or, or the most important factor when you start approaching those horses. Because when it comes into veterinary medicine, you want to be conservative. You want to just do what's necessary. Um, with laminitis, if you better off being more proactive than reactive. You don't want to wait uh, until you start seeing obvious changes because by then you're, you're far behind and it's really, really hard to catch up with those horses. So yeah, my goal is to actually catch it early enough that I can have a forecast of the things that can happen. So I start working on those before they do happen. I'm uh, talking with Dr. Raul Bross from the Root and Riddle Clinic, and um, how do you catch up with it before it happens? I mean, what, what is being proactive with that? Is there, I guess, is there a sign that a horse, and it happens mostly, I think, with stallions, doesn't it, when they're not, when they're not on the track, obviously, they're out in the field and in the breeding shed. I believe that'd be correct, isn't it? That's where you hear most of the laminitis cases. Yes. Uh, how, do you, how do you have an idea that, that he just isn't looking quite right that somebody from the farm will call you and say, I, something's wrong, I, I believe, will you come and take a look? I mean, can you get that far out to be yes, proactive? You, you could, and, and with education, we have come a long way with a lot of owners and, and, and farm managers and, and horse people are starting to be more aware of it. And it's we always have to keep asking ourselves, is it's a secondary cause due by some sort of kind of disease. Let's say the horse have um, if sick, let's just put it like that. If it has some fever or it has some diarrhea or have some pneumonia or it went through colic surgery or anything that will cause some sort of kind of toxic effect or grain overload, there's, def there's different pathways that will create laminitis. But you start noticing that. You start noticing that the horse uh, suddenly starts shifting more weight. Um, if you start checking their digital pulses on their their legs close to their feet, you notice that they have increased pulses. Mm -hmm. uh, some people like to touch the touch the hoof capsule and see if there's any change in temperature. And they talked about hot feet and hot foot and all those kind of things. And like you said, the the horse owners and and managers know their horses, so they can tell that the horse is not doing well. And then they call you and say, "Hey, doc, this horse is he's not doing right. He's being sick." They that's the First thing that that kind of throws the red flag, and then they say, you know, he's not really very willing to walk. He's shifting a little bit more weight, or he's laying down more often than he used to, and those are the stages that you really want to jump on it and 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 not wait until you start finding more obvious problems. I guess would Secretariat be the most famous case of laminitis, or at least the horse that uh, people that don't follow horse racing would be familiar with that name if you said that was his cause of death. Yes, uh, unfortunately, you know, and I was thinking about this and I have always thought about it and it was very unfortunate for the horse, but I think it was fortunate to some degree into the industry because he brought up that to everybody's perspective. You know, the horse that everybody loved mm -hmm. out of the blue next day is dead and yeah. succumbed to laminitis because if you go back and look into it, um, one of the latest videos of him was him running around the paddock. Yeah. And then a day later, two days later, 
uh, the you know they let everybody know that they had to put them down due to laminitis. And it's it's amazing how quickly it can hit, isn't it? It's I, I'm not trying to. I don't want to get apple orange comparison, but you hear about like elderly people that get pneumonia and they pass quickly within days when they look great and three days later they're they're passing. Uh, I guess that's how quickly laminitis can hit for those that don't follow horse racing. You probably have a loved one. Sadly, you may have had to gone through that with someone and that's how quickly laminitis can, can go just like a pneumonia through an older person. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, that's exactly how it goes. I mean, it can happen overnight. It can happen within hours. Mm -hmm. And, and if you want to compare it to humans, uh, when you have uh, a systemic disease that actually would attack your organs in humans, yeah, it's the same way with horses. You act that attacks their feet. And uh, due to uh, the architecture of the hoof caps or their weight and, and, and all those things, they, they just, they can, you can lose them overnight, even in within hours. How did you get involved in all this growing up in Puerto Rico? Were you around horses when you were a kid? Is that how you got involved yes. with the love for horses? Yes, and I can't believe you asked me that because I always, it, it's amazing how things happen. I never had any intention to, to do podiatry. I always want to do a, be a veterinarian. I want to be a surgeon. Um, I was born and raised with horses. That's what's, what's common for me. I'm very comfortable around horses. My dad... Uh, raise and, and breed Pasofino horses and show Pasofino horses. And due to his passion and dedication, he has very high-end broodmares, very high-end stallions, and I used to take care of them. And uh, throughout my whole life, I was dealing with horses that had laminitis, and I have no clue, no idea, and nobody else did in Puerto Rico. So I spent most of my life treating horses that we're quite uncomfortable, we're laying down, we're having abscesses, mm -hmm. and we lost a lot of horses, and I treated horses for a long time, and then I went to vet school. Um, they don't, at this point, they still don't teach too much about podiatry when it comes into to the school, so when I started visiting Root and Riddle, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Morrison, used to call for help late at night and I used to hold horses for him. Yeah. And he was treating horses with laminitis and it just kind of just that light bulb just went on. And I was like, wow, I've been doing this my whole life. This has been my passion. So I did it backwards because a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of the people that do what I do now, which is, you know, part, part podiatry, which is a veterinarian and a fair, there were fairs before. Mm -hmm. And then they eventually became veterinarians. I did it backwards. I, was, I became a veterinarian, and then I realized that my whole life I had a passion for, for helping horses that were going through this. So I decided to go through the path of uh, becoming a fair as well, and then putting both together. That's a, that's a great story. Yeah, that's it. Still gets me because I spent my whole life dealing with these horses, and we never had a clue. And when I got to the states and, and start seeing how things were happening. That's just changed my changed my life. I wanted to be a surgeon, and my brother, I have a twin brother. He's a surgeon, and when I realized what kind of lifestyle they were going to have, I decided I didn't want to live like that <laughs> when they're on call all the time. A little busy, aren't they? Yes. Not that you aren't. You ever yes. go to the movies? Do you get a chance to go see a movie? Yes, I do. I try to go to the movies with my family, with my kids. Do you like a horse racing movie in particular, one that's like a favorite of yours? Well, I mean, you mentioned Secretariat, and you can't, you can't. You can't deny that movie. Obviously, everybody wants to know what happened. Everybody yeah. wants to be what, that part of that history. Yeah. I mean, he's the, the horse that put everybody in the map and, you know, put not only the people that were actually in the horse industry, the people outside the horse industry became very, uh, um, they want to be part of it. So I was one of those ones that I was not around that area and decided I want to watch the movie. I would really want to see what happened and how everything evolved and, it was pretty neat. It was a really good, cool movie. Doctor, I appreciate your support. When we were talking about doing this show, you were one of the first that said, this sounds interesting. Yes. And one of the reasons is, seriously, to have you and the other vets from Rudin Riddle on, because I think there's a lot of people that like horse racing, even go to races on a regular basis. They don't know all about all the insides and all the workings of what vets do. Yes. And obviously, if you guys aren't around, then uh, we don't have horse racing. Yeah. I mean, everybody has to understand that all we want is the best for the horse. So when it comes to the public, uh, most of the time, only the negative things are the ones that arise. But that's not the case because everybody that is involved in the industry, um, all they care is for the well-being of the horse.
Doctor, it's been a pleasure. Come back anytime. Definitely. All right. Dr. Raul Bross joining us from Root and Riddle in our vet check this week. Stay with us. We'll have more on the horse racing show. Remember to like us on Facebook, subscribe and like us on the YouTube channel. You can listen to us on uh, your iPad, on uh, Google Play. What else? iTunes. Thank you. Thank you to iTunes. You know, I just show up, I talk, I have great guests on. <laughs> iTunes, yeah, that's another one. And you can go to uh, thehorseracingshow.com. I think we've got it all covered. We'll cover more when we come right back. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Glad that you're with us and delighted to have a great friend of mine for many years. He's an award-winning writer from the Daily Racing Forum. Uh, he's written books on the sport and is one of the few people I know in horse racing that I can actually talk movies with as well. So Jay Privman is the perfect guest for this Oscar Week show here on the Horse Racing Show. And he joins us from California, where I understand they still make movies. Jay, thanks for being with us. Kenny, it's my pleasure. I uh, always enjoy doing stuff with you. Yeah, we did shows together, and then they they didn't put us together. Remember when we did down this? We did Today at the Races on ESPN years yeah. ago together. We had fun. I think I think the ruling on that was we were having too much fun. Yeah. So guilty as charged. Yeah, I, I was guilty with you, you know, and and that's what <laughs> we're trying to do on this show. We're bringing the fun back into horse racing, where they want it or not. That's that's the motto. So we w- we want it, so we're going to do it. All right. We talk about Just racing movies. Sexy back, we're bringing fun back. That's exactly right. And Timberlake wanted to be on. I said, no, Jay Primman's on. <laughs> you come back later on, Timberlake. That's what I told him. <laughs> That's, of course, Bill Timberlake. He just works around here, not the other guy. <laughs> uh, hey, Jay, Moo, do you have a favorite horse racing? My Moo, I, We talked about this. Let It Ride's my all-time favorite horse racing movie, a movie with a horse racing theme. I don't know. But do, you, do you have a favorite? That would probably be it. I mean, I, I really like Far Lap as well. Yeah. So it would be a photo with, with those two. But in terms of just sort of pure escapism, fun, I mean, it, you can't beat Let It Ride because they just got so many things right about the degeneracy of the racetrack. You know, what was scary is I know some of those people. Not personally, but, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Personally, I know a lot of the people that the actors were playing. I'd go, good gracious, that's, uh, that's my cousin. I know him. <laughs> But you know, no, it was real. It was pitch perfect in that regard. Yeah, and Farlap's a terrific movie about the. I think people know the legendary Australian horse. I guess he's like the Sea Biscuit of Australia. Would that be fair to say? I think that's very fair. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then came to the U.S. in an untimely death. And you know, it's one of those. It tugs your heart. I mean, you 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 know, it's so good, and the the action's good in it, and it's realistic all the way through. That's what I like about that. That's a good choice with Farlap. But I knew you'd have a good choice. No, I like that. I thought that movie was terrific. You know, the old days before you and I were born, even though some people may not re- think that they may think that we were there with Tyrone Power and Betty Grable, <laughs> you know, yucking it up, you know, smoking cigarettes and drinking martinis and watching the races, but we weren't. Uh, but you know, th- those that Hollywood day is kind of gone, isn't it, from the sport? I mean, there's still actors I know come out, but it's not the same, I don't think. But you're around it more. You're out there in Southern California. Yeah, there definitely was. When I first came around the racetrack in the early 80s, there definitely were more celebrities, movie stars who came to the track on a regular basis. But I still see some of the real old-timers out there like Mel Brooks. He loves the races, and he's there quite often. But I'll, I'll tell you a story. I mean, and this, this is an honest-to-God true story. When I was in my early 20s and working for the L.A. Daily News, I – would occasionally write fairly pointed articles about the management of Hollywood Park. And Marge Everett, who ran Hollywood Park, didn't like that sometimes people were writing things about her track that she that didn't put it into a favorable light. So one day, she calls me up and says, now remember, this is pre-internet, pre-Twitter, when if you were a newspaper reporter, you just had to write your one story at the end of the day, and you were done. So she says, she calls me up, she says, can you have lunch with me next Saturday at Hollywood Park in the Turf Club? I'd really like to talk to you about a few things. I'm like, sure, happy to do that. And it was a day when the stake was the eighth race, so I could easily have lunch early in the day and then and then cover the race and be done with it. Anyway, when I show up in the Turf Club to have lunch with her, it was a table set for four, 
and she had me sit next to her very good friend who she had not told me was going to be part of our group, but I had lunch next to Elizabeth Taylor. Whoa. Drop the mic. That was pretty strong. That was like a pretty strong move on Marge Evers' part. You know, people like Liz Taylor and, and Frank Sinatra, and you look at the very first Breeders' Cup, the, the list of celebrities that were at the track that day, Cary Grant for that event, she had some real pull in, in Hollywood. And to your point, I mean, that, that era, there were a lot of celebrities back then, less so now. What did you and Liz talk about? It was funny. We mostly talk about the races, and I, I, you know, I look back at it now, and it's like, my God, I should have talked about so much more movie history with her. But it was more of a sort of a racing discussion, and 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 she couldn't have been nicer. I mean, it was it was really, I, I and I really regret that I don't have a photo of it. Oh yeah, uh, and all those kinds of things that you just you don't really think of. I just wasn't prepared for it. It wasn't like you know these days you have your iPhone with you, and if you want to take a photo with someone it's so easy back then not so much so um but that was that was definitely my uh in terms of a brush with greatness i I think i'd have to put that right at the top i'll tell you my friend and and that just you just like i say you just topped everybody's story i could tell you that (laughs) i could tell you like an actor or two that i've interviewed but you set had lunch with liz taylor I mean, this is Hollywood. Hollywood this Park, is really sure le- this is legendary stuff. You know, this is legendary stuff. We should have talked about National Velvet, right? Just to have the whole horse racing uh, or horsey theme. Yeah, I saw Mickey Rooney once here in Lexington. He was making a movie. I mean, I just saw him and nodded, and he nodded as I'm sure he did to thousands of people that acknowledged him because there were several people around him. But had I known that, I'd gone up and said, "You know, my good friend Jay Privman recently had uh, <laughs> lunch with Elizabeth Taylor, Mickey." I would have said that if I'd and known he, it. And he's another one. I was thought you were talking about celebrities used to come to the track. I mean, he was at the track all the time. Tim Conway. I mean, that Bob Newhart. They these Anne Bancroft before she passed away, being married to uh, to Mel Brooks, would would come to the track all the time. Um, so yeah, that's that was that was a fun era. That's for sure. And Dick Van Patten, who I'm sure you knew as well, he said in one time sure. we were doing a, an HD net broadcast out there. I was doing it with Chris McCarron, and he was walking by, and it was a pretty loose format that we had there. And, uh, you know, we were filling time between the races. So we spoke. He came over. I said, do you have a couple minutes? He sat down. He handicapped like three races. I think he hit two of the three races. He just sat there with us the rest of the day. I don't know. We, you know, we didn't pay him a SAG fee or anything. He just hung around. And, you know, what a nice man. Oh, he he loved it, and you know, and it wasn't just the uh, uh, the on-screen people who were into racing. Then, uh, you know, one of the great great directors of that era, Martin Ritt, yeah. he he was at the track all the time. You know, he did HUD and Norma Ray and all those kinds of movies. He he was a he was another regular, and he owned racehorses too. And, and with uh, Bobby Frankel. Yeah, oh, I remember. You know what? I remember. I never met him, but I remember the association with Bobby Frankel. See, I knew you'd know yeah, everybody. Yeah, no, there all the time. Uh, as far as uh, you know, I'd be remiss if we didn't bring this up. I, I'd love to talk movies all day, but I notice you cover horse racing, and uh, <laughs> and and one of my favorite things, daily racing form. Check it each week. Jay Pribman. He he's ranking the Derby horses who he likes as well as reading his articles. But I, I like the way that you always set it up, and you can read that, and it's great for the fans that are casual, especially that you know want to get to the basics right quick. Who to look for at the Derby? So I know we're still a few weeks away, but uh, who right now are a couple of three of the horses that you really think are standing out in the three-year-old ranks, Jay? So right now, I mean, the, the list that Mike Watchmaker and I put together, and our, our first one came out last week we always try and have our our first top 20 list come out about mid-february we figure about two and a half months of, of derby madness is is enough the rest is kind of overkill but shockingly bob baffert has the top two uh horses on our list right now they being the unbeaten game winner the breeders cup classic winner and the divisional champion the eclipse award winner from last year and then improbable also unbeaten who won the los alamitos futurity and both those horses are gearing up for their three-year-old debuts, which will come in early March. So five-time winner Bob Baffert and two-time Triple Crown winner Bob Baffert has, at this point in time, the top two horses on our list. I'm glad a guy like that gets a break, aren't you? 
Yeah, no, I, I was, we were starting to take up a collection for him. So <laughs> fortunately, it looks like he's going to be okay. I, I remember uh, a couple of years ago at the Breeders' Cup, because, you know, that was my assignment to stay with Baffert, and he didn't win. Not this past year, two years ago in Del Mar. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I remember after the race, he didn't win. I said, well, sorry, Bob, because we didn't do an interview with him. And Jill Baffert, who's a delight, his wife, she said, don't worry, Kenny, nobody's going to be feeling sorry for the Bafferts tonight. We ran second and third, I think, that year, right? They ran second and third behind Gunrunner. Right, with, uh, with game uh, collected and, and game winner. Yeah. Or not game winner, um, West Coast. Sorry. West Coast, yeah. They, they were saying, and that was uh, the Arrogate year. Yes, and, yeah, Arrogate was fifth in the that heat for fifth in that race. Yeah, who just didn't run well at Del Mar. I don't know. I, I, no, I do was, think there's something to it. Tonight. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's always fun. Does the Derby ever get old to you, covering the Derby? Obviously, you know, we're based here in Kentucky, and, and people talk about the Derby even when the Derby's, you know, almost a year away. Like they talk about Kentucky basketball all the time. Does it does it ever get, you know, routine at all to those that are coming in from California and other places covering it, you think? God, I hope not. I mean, yeah. it's just such a great event, and it's the, the one thing. Even if you're not a fan of horse racing, People watch the Kentucky Derby. They know to watch that. Uh, it's just like for auto racing, people will watch either the Daytona 500 or the Indy 500. I mean, they know that that's the pinnacle of those those kinds of sports. And uh, I, I, I it, it never gets old to me. I've covered Kenny every one since 1982, and I'm looking forward to going again this year. And I look forward to seeing you again this year. It is always good to catch up. And one day we'll go to a Kings game. One day. <laughs> I've said that for eight years, but one day, I promise. Let's let's wait till they're good again, because right now it's 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 tough being a Kings fan. Yeah, but you're a real guy. You're a true fan. You don't you don't back off the Kings. It's been a couple of Stanley Cups. They win it. They haven't done well lately. You still stay with them. That's what I love about you. I'm still I'm still there. I I'll go to nearly half their home games this year. Uh, Jay, listen, I really appreciate you taking time out. Maybe we'll catch up again as we get closer to the Derby and a few more horses shake out and we can talk more about the field, okay? I would love that. All right. Read him all the time, and you'll know what's happening in the sports world of horse racing. Jay Pribman of the Daily Racing Forum, who, as you know, knows a lot about movies as well and is the only person I know that had lunch with Elizabeth Taylor. That's all. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. So, Jay, thanks again, my friend. You're watching or listening to, depending on your advi uh, device or advice, device the horse racing show. Be sure to like us on Facebook and subscribe and like us on the YouTube channel. You can follow us on iTunes, on Google Play. Go to the horseracingshow.com and like us and follow us on Twitter at Horse Racing Show. How about that, Jay? You didn't know I was so technologically advanced. <laughs> You're a multimedia whiz. I'm telling you, I, I'm, I want to become the Howard Stern of horses. <laughs> Jay, thanks again, my friend. Thanks, Kenny. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Really happy that you joined us. Thank you for subscribing and liking us on YouTube. We keep building that up, and our Twitter followers at Horse Racing Show continues to grow. Thank you for your support on the show that's putting the fun in horse racing. At least we're giving it our best shot. Uh, great to have Michelle Phillips with us today. I mean, where else are you going to have a show where you can talk about horse racing, a great movie, Let It Ride, a great horse racing movie, and talk about getting up in the middle of the night with her then-husband, John, to write California Dream, an iconic song. That was – how'd you like that, Thomas? I thought it was incredible. Uh, she, what a – we could have had her on for like five hours probably, the story she could tell. We'd run out of show. Yeah, that's right. We'd have to – it'd be continuation of Michelle Phillips. Jay Pribman, my good friend with the Daily Racing Forum, and really keep up with him when you want to know. Just get the racing form each week. See how he's got the horses rated. Uh – on the on the road to the Derby, uh, he does a great job with that, and uh, it was good to hear him talk about. I've known him thirty years, and I never knew he had lunch with Elizabeth Taylor until now. How about that? Oscars are coming up this weekend. Honestly, I don't know who's going to win. I'm still upset. Let it ride. Never got a nomination, but you know that's that's me. And anybody know anybody got an idea who's going to win the Academy Award? I think it's a toss up this year. Yes, you you have an opinion on this. I think that 
it's you know really no matter which way you go with it you can't really pick wrong this year well that's true it, it seems like a, it's almost like a horse race you never know till they go maybe we should be like michelle phillips and bet on all of them put, i think that's the way to go put a bet down on everything please put a bet down on us again this uh this week thank you for doing that and join us again next week for episode six of the horse racing show i'm kenny rice take care everyone